Hello, everybody. We're going to be talking about wind. This is chapter six, number three. So um, wind is generally due to uneven heating of the earth. Warm air, the molecules are ex vibrating faster. That pushes them apart, lowering the density. So warm air rises. That lowers the pressure. Cold air does the opposite. The molecules are vibrating more slowly. They can contract to get closer together. That makes them more dense. They sink. That would raise the pressure. Winds blow simply from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And winds are going to blow faster along steep pressure gradients. That's where the isobars, when you're seeing an isobar map, wherever the isobars are close together, that's where you'll get the wind. Take a look at this. All right. So this would look like a weather map would. And you could see areas of high pressure and low pressure. And where you have the isobars uh, very close together, um, like in this area here, you'd have strong winds. Where the isobars are far apart, like in this area here, you'd have very calm winds, not much wind at all. Again, you have another area where the isobars are close together, and that would also be very windy. You can see hot air rising in hot air balloons. You go to a hot air balloon festival, those are bubbles of hot air. Notice they're open at the bottom, so they're not like contained. It's not like a helium balloon. This is just making the air inside much hotter. Hot air is less dense than cold air. That's why it rises. So sea and land breezes are great examples. During the day, the land gets hot and the air over the land starts to rise. Cool air from the sea is pulled in to take its place. If you ever think about standing during the day looking at the ocean, it feels pretty good. Um, your hair, your long, beautiful hair is trailing out behind you as the, as the air is in your face. Um, this would be a sea breeze, air being pulled in from the ocean because the warm air over the land is rising. So that would be the sea breeze and makes sense, right? Hot air is rising and the cool air from the ocean is coming in to take its place. So if you uh, have your paper out, do a sea breeze drawing. And I always say include a palm tree. Just makes it better. So um, a land breeze, what would a land breeze be? Well, during the night, if you've ever been swimming at night, you know the ocean. It's still the same temperature it was all day long. But now, because the land is much cooler than it was during the day, the ocean feels relatively warm. So now the situation's reversed. Air is rising over the ocean, sinking over the land. So now if you stand out looking at the beautiful ocean, your hair is all in your face. It's not as fun. A mountain breeze is the same thing. At night, the mountain gets colder. It radiates its heat to space, at least, at least if it's a clear night. It radiates all its heat to space, and the air starts tumbling down the side of the mountain and makes these mountain breezes. During the day, on a hot day, the mountain is getting very warm, and the hot air in contact with the mountain starts rising. And you can see the air being pulled up from the valley, thus a valley breeze. So uh, to measure the wind, we need to know both the speed and the direction. And the direction is always, and know this, the direction is always where the wind is coming from. If there's a tornado over a ways and the wind is blowing from that direction towards you, you want to know about that. But if there's a tornado someplace else and the wind is blowing it away from you, it's not going to be a concern to you. Weather is the same way. If there's bad weather to your west and the wind is blowing it towards you, you're going to inherit that bad weather. So you always want to know the direction the wind is coming from. We use something called an anemometer um, to measure the wind speed in miles per hour. It's a device with little cups on it. You see it's spinning around. That would be used to measure how fast the wind is going. And you see an arrow pointer with a tail on it that aligns itself to uh, which way the wind is blowing. So uh, both the speed and the direction uh, is important here. A north wind, it's predictive, isn't it? A north wind is going to bring you cooler weather. A south wind is going to bring you warmer weather. So here is an anemometer and a wind vane. You can see the cups on top are going to spin around in a faster wind. They're going to spin faster. And that wind vane will always point in the direction the, the air mass is coming from. So anemometer and wind vane. 
So in any situation with moving air, we want to know where the air came from, because wherever it came from, it's going to be bringing those conditions to us. So notice uh, air from down south would be warm and moist. We call this air maritime tropical. Okay, maritime meaning over the water. So it's moist, tropical meaning warm. Look at air to our north. Well, over Canada, it's continental. That would mean dry. Polar would mean cold. And these are what we would like to know about the air. So we can have cold and dry or cold and moist, right? Uh, maritime polar, um, polar meaning cold and maritime meaning moist. Uh, maritime tropical are on both oceans, but right in the middle of our continent, you could have continental tropical. That would mean dry and hot. So that's how we describe the weather. Notice these uh, designators here. MP stands for maritime polar. And notice the first letter is small, second letter is capitalized. And if you look on your chart on your reference tables, you will see that. So uh, we have CP for continental polar, CT for continental tropical. These would be dry air masses. MP for maritime polar, that would be moist and cold. MT for maritime tropical, okay, that would be warm and moist. So those are the major air masses that affect us. Now, weather has a whole lot to do with the interaction between air masses. So if we're talking about wind on the Earth, if the Earth wasn't rotating, holy cow, this would be so easy. Hot air would just rise at the equator. It would move north and south to the poles, and it would sink as it cooled at the poles. Then it would blow along the surface back to the equator. So here, the air would always be coming from the north, and it would always be cold. So isn't it good the Earth, in fact, is rotating? This is what it would look like if it was not rotating. And you can see, we would endlessly have cold air from the north where we are. Because the Earth spins, we have to deal with something called the Coriolis effect. Okay, it's often called the Coriolis force, but it's really not a force, it's an effect. Anything at the equator is moving very fast, anything at the poles is not moving at all. This is why the effect occurs. So something moving from the equator towards the poles is gonna keep that incredible speed. That's a thousand miles an hour it's going at the equator. It's gonna keep that speed, even though, no, it, even though now it's moving over lands that aren't moving as fast. So if you look at a globe and spin it in the correct direction, that's to the right as you're facing it, you'll see that an object moving from the equator to the North Pole will have that inertia and it will continue moving to the right, right? It's moving very fast on the equator and it's not moving, or the land underneath it is not moving as fast as you go away from the equator. So the inertia that it had, the real speed that it had at the equator, it'll maintain and it'll curve to the right. So an object moving from the North Pole to the equator, well, from the North Pole to the equator, it'll lack inertia and it'll be slower than the land moving, um, that it's moving over, and it will also curve to the right. So turns out all objects in the Northern Hemisphere curve to the right because of the Coriolis effect. All moving objects in the Southern Hemisphere curve to the left. Very easy. Northern Hemisphere is right. Southern Hemisphere is the other direction. So wind is a moving object and it will turn according to the Coriolis effect. So notice, this is clearly going to the right. This arrow here is clearly going to the right. Yes, good. Harder to see though, that this arrow is also going to the right. How would you tell that? Well, when you're shooting an arrow, it's customary to stand behind it. I think it's safer that way. So if you get behind the arrow, if you stand back here and look at the arrow, you'll see that in fact, it is curving to the right. Now, if you stand facing the arrow, somebody shooting an arrow at you, this is not a good situation. So please get behind your arrows. In the Southern hemisphere, that arrow is clearly curving to the left. 
And if you stand behind this arrow in the southern hemisphere, you'll see it's also curving to the left. I cannot emphasize enough, stand behind the arrow when you're curving it. So on a rotating Earth, um, it causes the winds to have a much more complex pattern, and I'll explain that as um, I draw it for you. There are going to be several pressure belts along the surface. So low and wet at the equator. At the equator, air is rising, okay, called the doldrums. Uh, the doldrums, if somebody suggests you might be down in the doldrums, it looks like you're depressed, like you're not invigorated. Uh, sailing ships of the time, when they were crossing at the equator, the winds would stop. And you can imagine that's a bad situation for a sailing ship. So they were in the doldrums. At 30 degrees north and south, air is sinking. So it's high pressure. Air is falling down on you. And that also would slack the sails in a ship and would often cause you to sit for weeks without being able to move on the ocean. Uh, this is a desperate situation. A lot of the trading vessels were in this situation. This area is called the horse latitudes, and it's called the horse latitudes for a very sad reason. Uh, many of these ships uh, carried conquistadors, um, and they would have their horses with them. And if the ship stays there long enough, you run out of water for the horses, and you would end up having to throw them overboard. And you can imagine there's few things that would be sadder than having to throw your horse overboard. Um, the only thing that would be sadder, perhaps, is everybody on the ship, as well as the horses, dying of thirst. Um, so they would sacrifice the horses. That's why they called it the horse latitudes. You won't forget that now, will you? Uh, again, low and wet. Air is rising again at 60 degrees north and south. This is one of the most awful places on the planet. Uh, the storms there are truly devastating storms, and sailors would try their very best to avoid them. Um, it was known as the Roaring Sixties. Uh, wherever it's wet is, of course, where you get storms. Wherever it's dry is where you get deserts. Not a lot of storms on the deserts. At the poles, it's high and dry. Believe it or not, the poles, uh, if you think of Antarctica, you think of a lot of snow and ice and such, but there's really very little snow. It's just that it really doesn't melt once it falls. Antarctica is the biggest desert on the planet. Air is sinking on it, and it does not storm too often. So this is how it actually looks because of the complexity of the um, Coriolis effect added into the winds. Why don't I draw that for you? In order to understand the drawing, you're going to have to understand that when we have air coming together, there's no place else for it to go, so it has to go up. Okay, when we have air coming together at the top of the atmosphere, there's no place else for it to go, so it has to go down. That'll make sense out of this next drawing. Wherever it's rising, you get warm pressure. I mean, you get warm air, low pressure, and it's going to be wet wherever it's rising. Um, wherever it's sinking, it's cold air sinking. It's going to be high pressure and very dry. It kills the clouds when it does that. So let's do this drawing, shall we? So I'm going to use blue to indicate air aloft. So here's what happens. Um, the air at the equator rises and starts moving up in both directions. Great. But by the time it gets to 30 degrees, and now this is the air way up high. It's not air at the surface. By the time it gets to 30 degrees, it's moving parallel with the lines of latitude. So it cannot continue moving up. Where can it go? Well, the only place for it to go is down. So it's risen up and it has to fall down here. When it gets to the surface, I'll use red to denote that, when it gets to the surface, it's going to spread in both directions. But of course, the Coriolis effect is still playing on it. So what's going to happen, the air on the surface is going to be forced down, back to the equator, 
and it's curving to the right. And again, stand behind the arrows if you want to understand this. In the southern hemisphere, now the arrows are going away, so it's a little easier to see. It's going to the left. So notice the air converges on the ground at the equator. Red is on the ground. So the air on the ground is converging at the equator. And again, once it converges at the equator, up it has to go. So that works. Once it gets um, above the 30 degrees, from 30 to 60 degrees, all right, now what is it doing? Well, the air has to spread out along the surface. And again, it'll curve to the right. Now you're standing behind the arrows, so it's easier to see. So the air coming down at 30 degrees north and south is going to be hooking in the northern hemisphere to the right. Now, this is approximately where we are in the United States. So you can see our wind is coming from the southwest. That's why our winds are the way they are. Now, in the southern hemisphere, the winds are curving to the left. And they're going to look like that. All right. Well, now let's go back up to the Arctic and think about the cold air sinking right there, sinking down to the ground. And when it sinks down to the ground, it's going to slide then along the surface. And if it's going along the surface, it's going to curve to the right in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's going to curve to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. And this explains our wind belts. Now, when they get to the roaring 60s, up they go, right? Some comes back over to the poles, some goes over here, and will sink down to the desert areas at 30 degrees. So where are the deserts? Why don't we do purple for deserts, right? The big desert areas are here where the air is sinking upon you. And sure enough, if you look at the desert southwest in the United States, it's around 30 degrees. Where you look at the Sahara Desert, it's around 30 degrees south. <clears throat> All the deserts in the world are located, the major deserts in the world, are located in these areas where the air is sinking upon you. So it makes a lot of sense. Now, where are the rainforests on the planet? Well, the major ones are all going to be located. Look at that right around the equator where air is rising over you. That'll make a lot of rainfall. Now you're not gonna have rainforest, but you're gonna have a whole lot of rain in these areas at 60 degrees north and south. That'll be very stormy areas because air is rising there as well. So this makes a lot of sense. I hope that helped. So here is what it looks like, all right? And everything I was talking about, the air is rising here, air is falling there, air rising there, and we have these all broken into cells. These are um, different cells of air, all rotating. You can see it makes sense when you look at the Coriolis effect and you realize that by the time air aloft has gotten to 30 degrees north and south, the Coriolis effect has turned it so it cannot go any further north. It certainly can't start going south because air is still coming up from there, so it's forced down. And that really aligns all these air pressure cells that you could have. This then uh, identifies how we name the winds. We name the wind where it's coming from. So if we look at the air here, all right, we call that it's coming from the northeast, so these would be the northeast trade winds. Notice, that's not the way we get our air. We don't have northeast trade winds. Uh, these winds are constant winds. Uh, the winds we have are prevailing winds. They're not quite as constant. The equator makes a great deal of force available to keep the winds always blowing a certain way. But once you're above the um, 30 degree line, between 30 and 60, it's prevailing westerlies. So it's mostly from, for us, the southwest. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, it's mostly from the northwest. Um, and they're prevailing. They're mostly going that way, but not always. Up top, 
you have the polar easterlies. Okay, they're mostly blowing from the east. And in the uh, southern hemisphere, you also have it also blowing from the east. Um, in this case, of course, the uh, blowing from the southeast. In the northern hemisphere, it's blowing from the northeast. So winds around highs and lows. Well, the Coriolis effect uh, causes winds around highs and lows to curl as well. High pressure, winds blow clockwise around high pressure. Really important to understand because that affects the weather. Low pressure is the opposite. So winds blow counterclockwise around the low. So draw arrows to show the wind. How is it going to go? Uh, so let's see, clockwise. Huh, how would we do clockwise? Well, let's see, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So clockwise would be like this. And it really would be coming out from the high as well, like that. How would they go around a low? All right, well, counterclockwise and in around a low. So counterclockwise and in around a low. There you go, right? So this is how this works. And you can tell this is going to make a big difference. Look at that. If you have an area where air is sinking down upon you like this, well, that's going to kill clouds. And as we study clouds, I'll get to show you that. But basically, the air is sinking. The air at the bottom is higher pressure. So as air sinks down, it is squeezed. When you squeeze the air, it heats up. If it heats up, it can hold more water vapor. So if you have a cloud caught in that, the cloud is actually getting heated up. The air it's in dries the cloud out and the clouds basically disappear. The exact opposite happens when air is rising. When air is rising, it's expanding and cooling. As it gets colder, it cannot hold all the water vapor it had in it. So eventually it reaches its dew point where the air is completely saturated. And if the air rises anymore, clouds are gonna form. Something I want you to notice, look at the bottom of this cloud. It's flat, why? Well, that entire mass of air that's rising reached its dew point at the same moment. So if you start looking at cumulus clouds outside, the little puffball clouds, notice. Now, you're from the ground perspective, so you, you can't really exactly see it right unless your teacher tells you, hey, the bottom of those are flat. Then you start looking at them and you realize the bottoms of those clouds are flat. Now, if you ever get to go up in an airplane, especially a small, small airplane, where you can fly up and kind of play with the cumulus clouds, you will go up and you will see, this is ringing a bell, isn't it? You will go up and you can see that um, as you get higher, you will see not only are those clouds flat, the bottom of all of the clouds, as far as you could see, is the same height. Because that air had the same humidity, and as it rose, all of the different places where the clouds are forming, it reached its dew point at the same time. Pretty cool, but that's gonna happen where air pressure is such that uh, it's warmer air rising up, um, creating a low pressure area underneath and uh, forming a cloud on top of that. Pretty cool. So most surface ocean currents are moved by the constant force of wind pushing on them. If you have a big tank of water and you <laughs> Eventually, you start pushing the water. You actually start affecting the water. Wind is always blowing on the water, so it starts pushing it. So if you compare the map of ocean currents to wind currents, you will notice some distinct patterns. But the ocean currents are also going to be deflected by the Coriolis effect. 